This is Tanya Lin with the Sistership Circle podcast. From spirituality, sexuality, and sisterhood to business, relationships, contribution, and creativity, the Sistership Circle podcast introduces a new model of feminine leadership where women get real and vulnerable about it all. Tune in for authentic advice that will empower you to be bold, beautiful, and brilliant as your true self. Hey sisters, welcome to our Sistership Circle podcast and oh, this is going to be a very hot and juicy conversation today with Eva Clay. So let me tell you a little bit about her before we dive straight in. Ladies, this might be something that you don't want your kids to hear. <laughs> We're going to be having um, a conversation today that, you know, is we're going to be talking about sex and libido and, and all that yummy good stuff. Um, perhaps we should uh, make sure that you have some headphones over your ears. <laughs> all right. So Eva Clay, MSW, LC, SW, is an acclaimed sexologist, psychotherapist, and professional troublemaker. I love that. <laughs> For the past 20 years, her mission has been to illuminate the menage a trois of soul, sex, and science. She's helped thousands of people unlock their innate potential for pleasure and is a former professor of neuroscience. That neuro, neuroscience, I'm having a trouble um, speaking today. She's bodaciously reminds us that smart is sexy and her work is an, is an elegant marriage of the profound and the playful. She offers sexual intelligence courses and coaching and when she's not teaching, you can find her making mayhem on a dance floor. And uh, you can find more about her at Ava, evaclay.com. So, yes, welcome. <laughs> welcome, troublemaker. <laughs> at your service. <laughs> and I thought, you know, since you are a troublemaker who likes to rock the boat and um, dive, dive right into the, the juiciness, Let's start with libido. You know, I think this is one of your favorite topics to talk about. I think it's something that, um, you know, as a as a mom of two little ones, I'm like, oh, where is my libido? <laughs> it's like the only time sometimes it comes is at that, uh, you know, when I'm ovulating, and it's just, uh, you know, it's something that I feel like I could definitely benefit from this conversation. So. Um, so let's start there and talk about women's libidos and how we can increase our libido as women, how we can flow with our, with our sex drive. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you, yeah, I love that. I've, I've been in practice as a sex therapist and sex educator for 22 years now. And this is the single most common question that women come to me with, women and couples. And the presenting problem is usually she's lost her libido, she's lost her sex drive, she has no desire for sex. So because it's so common, that's why I love to talk about it. And there's so many moving parts to this between the mind, the body, and the soul, the spirit. So it's, it's endlessly fascinating, and I, I feel like I can never know everything. But, you know, to say to your viewers, I think most women at some point in our lives have um, I don't want to say struggled with the libido, but we've experienced a sense of not wanting sex and it can often rock the boat in our partnership because our man or our, our sexual partner wants sex more than we do. Um, it can also go the other way around, which is less spoken about, but I still see that often in my practice where women have high libido and their partner does not. So when we look at what causes that, um, you know, some of the obvious conversations that happen, I'm just going to touch on them, but they're so obvious. I want to get to the less spoken about conversation. It's hormones, you know, our, our hormonal functioning impact our drive for sex. Um, stress. Stress is a huge libido killer. And I think, you know, stress is an epidemic right now amongst women and especially moms. We're juggling a lot, right? You can relate. Who are really Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're really juggling a lot. Um, and so to, to share this with your listeners, with your viewers, um, and to speak from a personal perspective, 
the thing I love for women to understand about stress is that it's not just a construct. It's not just an idea that kills your libido. It's not just that you're busy and thinking about other things. There is a real biochemical basis for why and how stress kills libido. And it has to do with cortisol. So the higher levels of cortisol we have in the body, the less our bodies will want to have sex. So when we're living under a lot of chronic stress and we have these high levels of cortisol, it's really important if you want to reclaim your libido, you have to constantly be clearing cortisol from your body. And that happens through um, things like exercise, movement, deep breathing, meditation, all these activities that actually work to regulate your cortisol and your hormonal balance in the body. And then I see this time and time again, magically the libido pops back. But it has to look like a lifestyle change. You know, if, if we want to feel juicy and turned on and make love with our partner regularly, we have to adopt a lifestyle that diminishes cortisol. Did I just click out there for a second? Yeah, but I'm back. Okay. Okay. So, okay, so that was the first thing was cortisol. Yes. Yeah. So we have to uh, keep those levels low, keep the stress levels low and constantly. I think of cortisol as like um, something we sweep out of the body. So imagine having a broom and sweeping this neurohormone out, out, out. And it's cumulative, so it stores. So the more cortisol like is stored up in your body, trust me, the less you're going to feel like having sex. You know what's funny is that I've done um, a Vipassana meditation, 10-day silent meditation. And, you know, it's this whole thing around, you know, abstinence and you don't want to, um, I, don't, I don't know if they've directly said this, but like no masturbation. And what I find is after a couple days of me sitting in silence and like clearing out, I am so horny at this, at the retreat. And I'm like, is this, am I supposed, am I, is this okay? You know, and it's like, I go into that whole spin and it happens every single time. <laughs> so anyway, awesome. um, so thank you. That is, it totally makes sense. When we meditate more, we calm ourselves down. We're less stressful, right? And then that naturally can increase our libido. Amazing. Okay. So what else? Yeah. Um, you know, one of my favorite things to do with couples is actually train them how to sweep cortisol out of each other's body. Mm. So um, <clears throat> a little personal disclosure here. Okay. So I'm, we like those. Yeah, we love those. <laughs> so um, I, you know, and this is in my like official signature story on my website, but I was married for 10 years in a very happy, conscious marriage. And I lost my libido completely. Um, I mean, you know, some of you watching may relate with this, but like even the idea of sex made my skin crawl. Mm -hmm. like, in this place of like, Ugh, don't touch me. I felt disgusted by my husband. He was, a, you know, is a beautiful, beautiful man, loving man. Um, we had a great relationship, but for some reason, my libido just ran away. And um, I wish I had known then what I know now. Um, so what I've installed now into my relationships, now I'm in a new partnership. We have ritual before we make love. So we actually spend, I don't know, maybe 20 or 30 minutes just massaging each other, which, you know, again, is a great way to clear cortisol. So using uh, very specific types of touch over the skin, either light finger, feather touch, tickly touch, or like scratchy or deep massaging over each other's body. So we like will sweep the day off of each other's body. And whether or not that leads to lovemaking, who knows? But it's, it's like a way of bowing and honoring your king and your queen, uh, of honoring each other. Nine times out of <clears throat> 10, it does lead to lovemaking because as you so poignantly <laughs> illuminated when we're cleared of cortisol, our natural essence is to want to commune, to want to merge, to want to invite pleasure into the body. And so that's one idea 
for beautiful our audience there. Mm -hmm. mm, beautiful. Yeah, we've noticed a big difference actually when we've incorporated more massage and like starting with intentional ritual before we just jump into it. Huge difference. I feel safer, right? To like open up and um, yeah, I just, I, I love that. All right. So what um, else we got? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm also a big fan of the head scratch. So, um, you know, mm. scratching each other's scalp, just sitting behind your partner and really like nourishing and really lavishing them with non-sexual pleasure. That's the key. You know, pleasure is healing energy. Pleasure heals. Mm. And pleasure is the antidote to cortisol. So when you're in a pleasurable activity, whether that's massage or watching a sunset or, you know, a, a smell, like we also incorporate essential oils into our lovemaking. Um, so pleasure, imagine pleasure as being like the broom that sweeps the stress hormone out of your body and clears the libido to come forward. So these examples I'm giving are great for couples who have generally a harmonious relationship and want to make love with each other. Mm. Now, the deeper cut of this, the deeper layer, are what we call withholds. Mm. So when we withhold a truth from our partner, we withhold a communication, we're storing resentment, right? I think most of us can relate with this, like we're just fucking mad at our partner and like we're closed and our body is tense and we're armored and he feels like making love and we're like no way buddy <laughs> you've had this experience probably um having a like a dialogue ritual i find is really impactful as well so it's just sitting across from each other and beginning with the simple sentence stem like right now i'm aware of and just completing that sentence with each other over and over and over again. Mm. And my partner and I call it clearing. So mm -hmm. when we just simply need to like pour or ventilate our feelings, no matter how irrational or irrelevant or, you know, unfair that might be, just offering a, a space for each other to empty. Mm. Yes. Yeah. So um, very powerful. Very powerful. And that often will clear, clear the way as well. And whether you make love in that moment then, or you wait a day and come back, because sometimes it takes us, you know, a whole cycle or a period of time to recalibrate in our system and for our bodies to begin registering safety with our partner again. Mm. Yeah. Amazing. Those are such powerful tips and, um, and I can see how, yeah, that's, I can see how those show up in my own relationship. So thank you for that. And, you know, one of the things that you um, do is work with women as they are going into menopause, women are over 40. And so there's a lot of women here who um, are in that stage. And um, I know I've, I've heard from a lot of women in our community who are struggling with this. And also, for those of you who are approaching 40, like myself, <laughs> what's to come, um, I think it would be great knowledge of what are just a few of the things that women can do um, to have better sex after 40. Yeah, I love talking about this. So I just turned 48. And yeah, and you don't look it. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank wow. You. <laughs> um, and, you know, just on a, just a completely personal level here, I just want to talk, you know, heart to heart with you and your audience. I just entered perimenopause and it caught me completely by surprise. I was not ready for this at, you know, at 47 already. Um, and I've just had a very powerful experience of coming out on social media and to my audience with my age. And I realized that I'd been sort of keeping my age a secret as if it were some flaw that I didn't want to disclose. Mm, yeah. And I really want to challenge this uh, in our culture. And I feel like um, for us as visionaries, as leaders, as women who are visible and sharing a message that it's important that we dispel these myths about 
um, our age being a deficit or, you know, or something that would hold us back in any way. So I came out on social media and I can't tell you how many women have responded to that and appreciated that because my age is not a flaw. And being 47, entering menopause, um, from you know the medical information that I'm I'm learning right now, and the um, collaborators I'm working with, the the medical doctors and healers I'm working with, we need to start preparing for menopause at 40. Mm. Um, every year after 40. Good to know. Yes, please. If, I'm approaching. Good. So this is really great for you to know. So to know that your body, the the, the wheel of your body is turning already, you know, right around 40. And so important to really bolster some of these physical and biological systems now and to prepare you for that change as you progress. And um, I know for me, like certain supplements have been really helpful and I wish I had started them sooner. Hmm. The, um, the symptomatology, like the the things that we read about menopause, like hot flashes or dryness or loss of libido, et cetera, I find it's really important not to buy into that. Some of that symptomatology may happen for you, but we have to, or I'm going to speak for myself. I'm finding myself um, deeply committed to transitioning through this in such a succulent way. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> succulent menopause and i'll have some of that yeah take it please this is you know this is my emerging message to women and it, and it has to start you know menopause is an interesting thing because it, it's very biological and hormonal but it's also very psychological and this is my jam is to look at how these two interface you know the menage a trois of soul sex and science so i love to look at this the conversation between the mind and the body and of course, as we know, as conscious women, that the mind creates the physical state. And so how we frame menopause is everything. And even if you're nowhere near it, if you're in your 30s, or like you, if you're approaching 40, to begin to frame that upcoming inevitable transition as a passage into queenhood. And at 48, I feel more alive, more powerful, more sexually turned on, uh, more capable than I ever have in my entire life. Mm. I want to be a beacon oh. and a role model for this, for, for what menopause can look like. It mm. is an initiation into the most powerful and creative time of your life. So... I would say, you know, in terms of giving a bullet point, giving a nugget to your listeners is about declaring right now what you want menopause to mean for you, about the cessation of your menses. You, know, you are no longer slave to that cycle. You are no longer in that cycle, you know, in the moon cycle. So you're in a, just a different creative cycle that you get to name for yourself. You get to define that for you. Wow. What a powerful reframe. And especially in our culture where it's just, you know, just there's this fear of death, um, which we can go into a little bit later. Uh, there's this, you know, everyone getting, um, you know, just not wanting to stay young forever. And there's actually so much power in stepping into that next phase of life and really honoring the wise woman and all that she offers. And, and what if our culture like really revered the wise woman and asked for her counsel. And so for us to reframe cult, the, our culture, we as women have to first reclaim that within ourselves. So I love this. I love the stand that you're taking. And I think it's so important. And like, I'm feeling so juiced up and like empowered as you're speaking this. So thank you. Yes, I love it. I love it. Um, and so I was having a conversation with a girlfriend about this recently, and I just want to share a nugget that we, that we arrived at. Um, and that is about the loss of youth. You know, or, um, I don't want to call it a loss. It's a transition 
you know, into a different phase of life. And our, our culture generally does not celebrate wisdom in women. Okay. So first of all, I think it's important we surround ourselves with women who do and create culture. Now you're in the Bay area. No, San Diego. San Diego. I'm, sorry. I'm up in the Bay area all the time. So that's why you might think I'm from the Bay area. <laughs> okay. I don't know why I thought that. Um, but I live in LA, which is like probably the worst place in the entire world <laughs> to age as a woman. And I'm in the second in San Diego. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, Southern California, for sure. No, like, totally. No, it, it's, it's really hard. And so I, I'm looking at what fortifies a woman's self-worth as she ages, and particularly in a culture and a context where wisdom is not celebrated. So what fortifies our self-worth? And on a very basic, primal, neurobiological level, it's having meaning in the tribe, making a valuable contribution to the tribe. And so if you're looking ahead into menopause or you're there or you're, you're, you know, you're in any stage over 40, what will fortify your sense of self is doing meaningful work in the world. And naming that as meaningful and recognizing the contributions that you're making. Because many of us women are doing meaningful work in the world, such as raising children, you know, um, being a homemaker, being a partner, et cetera, et cetera. But we're not recognizing that as meaningful. Yeah. Yeah. And so when, when the biology, this is like neuroscience. So when you're, your biology recognizes that you are important to the tribe and that what you're contributing is meaningful and vital. It keeps your body young because you're needed <laughs> and you recognize that. Wow. Yeah. It's so true. Yeah. So meaningful work in the world is what fortifies our experience from being the mother to what I call the queen, you know, the space in between mother and crone these queen years of 40 to 55 or so um that span of time you know this conversation is so timely i love it um and and i'd love also for us to talk a little bit about about death and the the stage after <laughs> um because it's been very much up for me my dad just turned 70 and i've had a lot of people around me um couple very close friends moms die who I personally knew um, a lot of people with cancer around me and um, and so during my dad's 70th birthday I was like okay if I was to give my dad the eulogy because I had just gone and listened to one of my best friends from growing up give the eulogy for her mom um, at the funeral and um, or celebration of life and so I was like, okay, if I was to give my father a eulogy, like, what would I say to him? And how can I, oh, I was just like getting choked up about this. Like, how can I celebrate him? And then having this conversation with my mom, you know, cause this is all during the holidays. And my parents are like, we are ready to retire, like doing the holidays, you know, like it's time for you guys to step up. And what's so beautiful is I was having this conversation with my mom about her dying and like how present I was to that and how scary that was for me. Um, and also this declaration of like stepping into the matriarch of my family and just the fear that comes up around like this next, like I am like deepening into motherhood and um, you know, so that, and then my brother having the same conversation, it's like my brother and I gave this talk, our talks. And then the four of us like circled up and my, my, brother was talking about like stepping into being the, main, the patriarch of the family and him telling my father like you know dad I know one of your biggest fears of dying is that you'll die before mom and that you know and and worried about her and I just want you to know I've got her and like just the like all of us are like sobbing it was just such a beautiful healing powerful um experience but um it's scary you know and we don't have these conversations about death and um, we don't like just that we don't talk about like stepping into these rites of passages. I see it as like this next rite of passage for myself of like stepping into being the matriarch of the family. And, oh, it's like, it's so, <laughs> I feel it right now, like so strongly. So okay. I know that you've, um, 
but also, you know, uh, in your own grief and mourning of your mother passing. And, and, um, and so it just, just feels like it's all skipped out just there for a second ah, so i was saying i'd love to hear some of your thoughts and um and your perspective and, and just because this is all connected and it's all you know what we're talking about of this transition and owning our wisdom and stepping into this next phase of life um and then your mother passing and and your grief and so i just i, I just i really want to go into this because death is something our culture just doesn't talk about Again, yeah, along with aging and menopause, death is not on the top of the, of the list of what we talk about. Um, yeah, so, you know, I've, I've had a very deep dive with death this year. Three of my family members have passed. My mother, mm. a beloved uncle, and a cousin just on Christmas Day. So this is mm. January 4th today, so this was recently. Um, and I just, you know, kept having this, realization that no one has prepared me no one has prepared me for how prevalent death would become in the middle of my life in the second half of my life and the reality is it is it is prevalent as we watch the wheel of life turn in our family and amongst our friends this is part and parcel to middle age and without any preparation or support, <clears throat> I think it, it can be very scary going into it. So, um, you know, I've come to really embrace like a, 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 a mindful, conscious embrace of death. And this has been my work over the last year. And I've, I've studied literally like every kind of death philosophy there is and studied the afterlife and studied um, I'm studying right now death midwifery, you know, how to be sort of a death doula and support people in their passage. And um, the more I study this and the more I just get comfortable with the texture of death in my life, um, it inoculates me from this fear and tension. Like when you talk about it, this is how most people talk about death. It's like, ah, you know, this like, there's this kind of terror and this cringe of the inevitable and it's so terrifying. I think that's why we don't talk about it. And it's not something that we're, we're brought up with. We don't see death. You know, death is institutionalized now. Um, our, we're losing our death rites, our death rituals. And, and part of what makes death an acceptable part of life is to see it and to feel it and to be with death and we're not given that privilege anymore until so we hit midlife and we're like, what the fuck? Oh my God. Um, so this is part of my message also is to, um, to understand for, for me, okay. So for me, it's been to understand that death is a transition to another form of consciousness. And I very much feel now the presence of my family members who have passed in a new way and in an elevated, ascended way. And for me, having so much death this year has elevated me to really another level of spiritual transmission. Like I feel the other side now. And for many people, that's what death does is it, it when someone you love passes, it gives you a link, um, a, a channel of communication between this side and the other side. And the benefits of that have been profound. Um, so I know for me, this has been my first Christmas without my mother. And yes, it's been very painful and it's, it's, it's necessitated that I turn toward instead of turn away that I turn toward a certain type of grief a certain type of pain that I didn't even know existed inside of me so it's made me just a deeper person a, a, 
um, a wider person in terms of my capacity to teach and to hold and to transmit. It's given me such a deep reverence for life itself. And watching my mother die, you know, holding space for her while she transitioned was the most exquisitely beautiful experience of my life, truly. Mm, I'm just on the verge of tears, just this whole conversation, and um, just because it's been so alive for the past few months. And what I'm most present to right now is, um, I mean, Day of the Dead, right? Like in Mexico, and then um, the Disney movie that was just out recently. Cora. Am I, huh? Cora or something? No, um, I, I'll think about it. But, um, and, and so when you said that, that it was like, oh my God, that's so true. Like that it's the connect, like we have this, this link to the afterlife. Like we have this link to the unknown that the, that it's just, yeah. So I, but that's not what I wanted to say. What I wanted to say was, um, in you speaking about death and the, and being a death doula and like death mid midwifery is just reminding me of the process of birth and going through pregnancy and then noticing everyone pregnant, you know, so it's like everyone's pregnant around me when I'm pregnant, right? Just like when you're going through that all of a sudden go into midlife and all of a sudden everyone's dying and this total unknown experience of labor and then you're on the other side and you're raising this baby and it's just like, it's, it's a whole, I'm in this whole other dimension. Yeah. Literally, I mean, I'm literally on the other side of, like, I am in a whole different world than before that first birth. And the fear that comes up around it, right? And the, just the unknown and the mystery. But I'm like, wow, like, the death process is essentially... That happened, like there was a death that happened during that birth. Yeah. The death of the old me, you know, and just like, and there was so much grief that came up. So I'm just, it's like, yeah. And when we're talking about, it is this wheel of the cycles of life and this wheel of life and the wheel is turning. And it's just so fascinating, just the connections and the links that we can, you know, make from that. And it's like, wow. Okay. Yeah. And, and what a privilege, what an opportunity for us to go into death consciously. Yes, I've got goosebumps from head to toe right now, hearing you, you speak about the parallels. So, and I, and I just want to speak into this piece around like the going into death consciously. So um, one of the women who was in our mastery program, um, she's in her late 70s and um, she's in preparation for death right now. Um, you know, she's been sick lately and she asked a few of her friends whose um partners had died and she said what are some of the conversations did you did you have with your partner before they died nothing and so she's taken it on with her husband to have the conversation of her own experience of going through this preparation for death but also talking about what life's going to be like for him when she passes. And so she, they're, they're both preparing and then bringing her daughters in and actually having a facilitated conversation with a facilitator for them to all talk about her passing. So they're all preparing for it. It's beautiful. Yes. Yes. And so there's a consciousness and she's like, I just feel so privileged that I get to be conscious about this process. How freaking cool is that? You know, like, Next level spirituality. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. And, and yeah. I love this example you give because this is, you know, when we live tribally, you know, we're, we're tribal beings, um, there, there was so much ritual and support and acceptance of this inevitability. And we've lost so much of that. And like when you say that your friend, um, is creating a conscious sort of new way. I would say it's actually the old way that she's Thank you. inviting back to speak consciously about our deaths and, and our transition. And so in this way, like we don't need to have tension or fear 
about it that we can I, I know for me, I've embraced like the deepest, deepest, deepest chamber of my soul and myself and my emotional body as a woman through the experience of turning toward death instead of turning away. And the, the I'm no longer afraid of death. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you what freedom that has brought me. It, it's the most liberating thing I've ever done in my life is to no longer be afraid of a loved one passing, and I'm no longer afraid of myself passing into the yeah. next dimension. And so when you're living without fear of death, you know, it, it's like, I get, we don't have time to dick around. Sorry if I'm cussing. We don't have time. You know, do what you came here to do and get it done now. You know, make your contribution to the world, share your gifts, share your love, shine your heart. We don't have time to do anything else but to live full out. Mm. And that has been the gift of death in my life. Mm. You know, and, and so linking and transitioning to this last part of the conversation today around, you know, you, you're coming more authentically into who you are in your work. And I think that this has a big part of it, right? Of like confronting death, no longer being afraid of death, coming into a deeper alignment with like, who is, who am I? And wh what am I here to bring, right? So can you, can you share more about like, yeah, that, that authenticity and coming deeper into alignment with the work that you're doing in the world? Yeah, I'd love to. Okay. I, I still have <laughs> I'm so excited about this conversation. Right? It's so good. <laughs> it's like we're hitting all the taboos, which is exactly what I love to do. Um, so coming more into alignment and authenticity with my work for me lately has looked like this. Um, death has been a reality puncture for me. Like when you talk about um, after giving birth, having a different world, I call that a reality puncture. So you entered a different reality when you became a mother. And you know, certainly, <laughs> I think most mothers would agree with that. Um, and death for me has been a reality puncture. It's been an awakening, a wake-up call. And this often happens when we lose someone in our community or someone we love in our family unexpectedly. You know, what happens suddenly, we're awakened to the finite nature of our being, of our humanity of our life and that finite nature of our life puts the pedal to the metal it accelerates us so in terms of being authentic in my work like I don't have time to play the game of like as I mentioned earlier I am trying to be young and beautiful and perfect I don't have time to play that game I don't even have the energy to give it anymore like I, nope. <laughs> I am who I am. Yep. This is what I'm going through. So this is what I'm going to teach. You know, I'm entering menopause. So fucking what? I'm not 25 anymore. I am 48 and I am going to rock 48 for you. I'm going to show you how it's done. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> hey mama. Oh yes. And, and really for me, like a process of shedding, uh, all of the pretenses and the shells and the, the, the image, the ego. For me, death in my life has been an ego death. And I think that's often what moms talk about as well, that the center of your universe shifts right from you to your child, your children, your family. And for me, I don't have children, but I have my message and what I teach in my business. That is my child. Yeah. So the center of my universe has shifted from it being an egoic, centric image based way of walking in the world to it being a service based way of being in the world and mm. so when i uh partition my ego as as much as i can you know look it's a practice like i still want to look beautiful but i partition my ego out of the message it becomes even more crystal clear and i'm finding women are responding to that uh, remarkably, you know, my programs are exploding because um, I'm, I'm not in it to look good or to prove anything. I'm in it to profoundly serve. 
I don't have energy for anything else. So um, my marketing has shift, shifted, my um, <clears throat> branding, my, you know, everything is shifting now to point toward women in midlife, women in the second half of their life, actually, so over 40. Um, because I want to be a living laboratory for what this stage of life can look like for women. And I want to live more transparently than I've ever lived before so that they can mm, learn from my mistakes, learn from my triumphs, learn from what I'm finding, what I'm discovering. And, and everything's got to line up with that. And I find that when there's that alignment of the truth of who I really am, with my message, with my offerings, which the way that I'm teaching, the curriculum that I deliver, the results that I deliver, there's like a, it's hard to explain. It's like a, it's like an explosion. There's like an actualization. It, it's like the, um, the, there's a laser effect. And, and I feel potentiated in my work right now, you know, very activated. And, and really death has been the catalyst for that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, this is so, I'm like, this is amazing. Cause this is the, this is literally the conversation I've been having for the past couple of weeks. And so I'm just like, you know, it's just so amazing when we have these synchronicities and then having the, these interviews that are just so on point. And um, so one of my friends whose mother just passed very suddenly um, right before um, Thanksgiving and you know she was basically like a few years from now i'll do these things right and then she passed and those things are gone and that was what she was talking about on her deathbed is like these dreams that she didn't get to fulfill on and so the conversation we were having is yeah what are the things that we're saying are like the someday one day of what i want to do that i'm putting off how are those priority and if so how are we going to make them happen today? And not thinking about, oh, I'll do that after I do X, Y, and Z. No, now. If that really means something to you, do it now. So I think both of those pieces of like, who am I? And letting go of ego and just like being your full self-expression in your work in the world and like just being like full out, you know, full on visibility and this is who I am and I'm not going to be pretending I'm someone else and what are the things that I want to be doing that I'm putting off that really mean something to me and how can we make this year the year that those things like we actually step into like what are we really committed to yeah oh god I love the <sighs> yeah yes. and and so for I love it so much so for me it's like if if you're listening to this <laughs> and you're Scrolling through the, the list of things that you haven't done and want to, I think a really productive way to start is to look at what do I need as a resource that will give me the courage, the strength, the time, whatever resource it is you're needing to begin initiating, to initiate this movement. And I find what is most often needed and less talked about is community support. So I would you know, ask you to, to look around and, and really evaluate, do I have a community that supports this dream of mine? Do I have the tribe that helps me to launch the thing I know I'm here to do, but I haven't had the courage or the time or the X, Y, Z to do yet and get yourself into community. Yep. That's why we exist. Sistership Circle is creating that community for women. Absolutely. And it's like we and so the thing is with sistership it's like okay we get to build this community of like-minded sisters on the path here and we get to practice being in circle and then it's like then we bring that out into your our lives right it's like because it, 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 part of what happens is we find these online communities we find our soul family online and then but how do we then translate that and also attract that into our local communities and also like bring that into family right and it's a, it's a skill that we get to learn together here at Sister Show. So I love that. Yeah, we, we, need, we need community. We need support. Can't do this life alone. It's all about relationship. Number one. 
Mm. Oh, this is so good. So in wrapping up here, um, do you have a free gift for our ladies today? Something that they can come and check you out? Get Uh, some juicy nuggets from you? Yes, I do. I would love if you pop over to my website, you can get my free gift, which is a self-love and pleasure hypnosis. Ooh. So one of the things I do is hypnotherapy. I'm a, a big believer. Um, I've done it for many, many, many years. So I have recorded for you a special hypnotic meditation. It's 15 minutes long to increase your self-love and your pleasure. Mm, I love that. Great. All right. And that'll be in the show notes as well. So you could just click that link and go grab your self-love and pleasure meditation, your hypnosis. I love that. And if you were going to have the megaphone and shout from the rooftops for all the women out there listening what's the last thing you would leave them with Mm. i would leave them with you are your best lover great sex deep pleasure fulfillment begins and ends and is encircled within your ability to love yourself Mm -hmm. please do something kind and loving for yourself today I love that. Thank you so much for all of your beautiful wisdom today as you're continuing to step more fully into your wise woman. And um, yeah, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for tuning in. We'll catch you next time on the next Sistership Circle podcast.